Wow, what a privilege to have you spend a few minutes with us here at the World Equestrian Center. I'm Chaplain Larry Spielman, and this may be the most important thing that you do this week. We believe God's Word was meant to help you in an everyday journey of life. So be blessed as we get started today. So this morning, I want to talk to you about manure. That's kind of an ugly subject, isn't it? I mean, you know, you don't really expect to come to church and hear about manure. But manure is a a thing that probably everyone that has an animal has to deal with. I mean, whether it's a dog, whether it's a horse, whether it's cattle, hogs, doesn't make any difference. Somewhere you have to deal with manure. It it just is just one of those things that uh, you can't get away from. And most people uh, don't really like to deal with it, right? I mean, most people would rather have somebody else clean their stalls, uh, somebody else uh, take the wheelbarrow and dump it or, you know, run it out, however you you dispose of it. Most people would rather have somebody else to do that. Uh, But I want to share with you about a man named Joseph Oppenheim. Joseph Oppenheim. Have you ever heard of him before? Probably not. Joseph Oppenheim. He was a he was a very accomplished musician. He uh, specialized in piano and pipe organ. Um, there's something for you. Uh, he was he was fluent in four languages, and he was very well read in literature. He was an excellent speaker, and he was a great educator. As a matter of fact, he was one of the first teachers in the state of Ohio to receive a lifetime. Uh, teaching certificate. So he didn't have to go back and get it every, every so often. He had a lifetime teaching certificate because he was, he was that good. Uh, but with all of uh, uh, Joseph's accomplishments and all the things that he could do, he found a new way to think about the manure. Now, you would think you wouldn't have anything to worry about if you had all that stuff, those credentials behind you that you, well, the last thing that you'd be thinking about was manure. But that was Joseph's thought. And the reason that he was thinking about that was that in the uh, 1890s, uh, he was the schoolmaster of a one-room schoolhouse in Ohio. And he got concerned because the older boys were always missing a lot of time at school. And one of the reasons they were missing that time was because they were uh, out working on farm chores. And so he started studying the whole situation and what was going on with them. And uh, he realized that there was a, a particular farm cho- chore that was taking a lot of time. And that was dealing with the manure. In the town where he was uh, the schoolmaster, there was a company there that was building a manure unloader, basically. It was a wagon and had a drag chain on the bottom of it. If you've ever seen a manure spreader, you know, you know what I'm talking about. But it, it had a drag chain on the bottom of it, and it just basically drug the manure out on the field as the wagon went around. And then they had to get another piece of equipment, and then they would go back and forth and spread all of that out so it wouldn't burn the ground. And so Joseph looked at that situation and said, you know, there's got to be a better way. Isn't that how most inventions happen? We're thinking that there's a need. And so we find a way to fill that need. And so, so Joseph, he uh, builds a little prototype out of a cigar box, knocked the end of it out. And he had this idea because he had watched the kids playing this ball, uh, a ball game. And they had a, a particular kind of bat that was kind of flat and it had an angle. And whichever way they hit the ball with that bat, the ball would go in a different way. And it, it sparked a thought with him. If the manure spreader had these bats on the back of it, it would spread the manure and, and uh, disperse it. And then they wouldn't have to go back over the field and drag it around. And so he built this prototype. And after that, he was able to get a patent on it. And eventually he acquired the patent for the, for the um, uh, manure unloader wagon. And he put the two of them together and he built the first manure spreader and uh, sold those. Uh, as a matter of fact, his company uh, sold a lot of manure spreaders. His company, you may be familiar with it, but, but maybe not because it's, it's kind of been out of business for a while. It was sold, but it was new idea equipment. New idea. That was the name of the equipment. And they ended up building all kinds of farm equipment. They built hay balers. They built corn pickers. They built uh, combines. They built hay binds. They, all kinds of things came out of this new idea uh, because Joseph knew that there was a better way or a new way to get rid of manure out of the barn. 
Now, I, I think that that's really kind of uh, important for us today because we're in this series. We started last week, and, the, and because of the show series, A New Way to Go, uh, we're looking at a new way, dot, 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 a new way, and we put a word in there each week. And last week, it was a new way to live. Today, it is a new way to think. Hopefully, you're open to that. Because just like Joseph Oppenheim, when we start to think that there's a new way to think, uh, it can change our life. It can change the way we live. And it's, it's really important for us uh, to understand that today when it comes to living out the Christian life, a new way to think. So why is that so important? You know, one of the reasons that, that I believe we need a new way to think is because every battle that you and I face in life starts out with our thinking. It starts out in our mind. There have been a lot of books written and different things that have covered that subject that, you know, the battlefield of your mind, you may have read that book. There's, there's this thought that everything that we deal with in life comes out of how we uh, handle it in our minds. Now, you all are thinking right now. You're dealing with things in your mind. You may even be wrestling this morning in your mind thinking, trying to just keep your attention here rather than letting it be dominated by something that's going on out there. Maybe it's the show later. Maybe it's, maybe it's associates or employees or I, I don't know what you might be thinking about, but, but there, there's this struggle sometimes in all of our minds to deal with certain things and deal with them the way that we, we ought to be. And, and I want you to know this morning that if you lose the battle with temptation in your mind, most likely, most likely, you will carry out sinful behavior, behavior that is contrary to what God wants us to do. And so when we're thinking about a new way to live and also a new way to think, then how we deal with and how we conquer those battles in our mind is, is so important to us to be able to live out God's principles and God's way in our life. Oh, by the way, if anybody wants to say amen anytime, it's okay. Well, everybody will hear you and it'll, it'll, it'll sound really good in here. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to at this point. <laughs> but you know what? On the other hand, if you, if you, if you conquer, if you conquer those thoughts, if you win against those thoughts that are tempting and wanting to lead you away from God, if you win, most likely you will carry out and practice righteous behavior in your life. And so how we deal with these things, these things that go on in our mind are extremely important to us in following God's plan and God's will for our life. The Apostle Paul describes this in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 5, he starts off with this. Those who are dominated by sinful by the sinful nature think about sinful things. Are you with me? People who are dominated by, by, by uh, the sinful nature think, think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So let your sinful nature... Uh, excuse me. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Well, I don't know about anybody else, but I need peace of mind a lot of times through the day. You know, you get cranked up on all the stuff that's going on around us. And, and don't you just sometimes wish that you could just put it on pause for a little while and relax for a little bit and think clearly? I don't know. Maybe you're, maybe you're better at that than I am. But, but here's the thing that I think that is so important for us, that we have to embrace a new way of thinking if we're going to manage and if we're going to live life the way God wants us to live it. It is so important for us to embrace this new way of thinking in every aspect of our life, especially our Christian life. You know, I was thinking about diets. Diets are a good example, right? Uh, about changing our thinking. You know, honestly, you can, you can get any diet, and if you follow the guidelines for the diet, unless, you know, something's wrong physically with you, but if you follow the guidelines of pretty much any diet, you, you'll find out that you'll lose weight. 
The problem really isn't in following the diet and losing weight. The problem is when you don't change the way that you think about food, you keep going back again and you get on this roller coaster where one minute you're, you're where you want to be in your weight and the next minute you're, you're back again struggling with it because the thinking process doesn't change a lot of times with the diet. You know, we're just following the rules, right? And, and I think that sometimes that that even happens in, in, in Christianity. People just uh, get so focused on the rules that if I just do this, their thinking doesn't really change. They don't really allow God to have control of their mind to help them think the way that he wants them to think. And so they just follow the rules, go through the, the routine. We talked about that a little bit last week in how that, that's religion and not relationship. But God wants a relationship with us that will help us to think differently about things. And so if you want lasting weight loss in your life, you have to start thinking about food in a different way. If you want to be uh, faithful to the Lord, if you want to live this life that God's called us to live, we have to start thinking differently about who God is and what God's plan is for our life. Our spiritual success really depends on us adopting the importance of God's word. If we don't think that God's word is important, if we don't think what God says is important, then most likely we're not going to give that much attention. We're not going to care that much about it, right? Well, I mean, we're going to be, we're just going to, uh, it's just going to be something that we just read and put off to the side and, and you know, who, who really cares about what, what happened? You know, I really believe that everything in this world, this world is designed right now to, to really keep us from believing what God says. If you look at the educational system, how that uh, we begin with, even with uh, children that are preschool, and we take them all all the way up through uh, high school and in the universities, we're 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 told a different story than what the Bible says about creation, right? If you can attack the very heart of the Bible, I mean, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you don't believe that today, then then what what really makes a difference about the rest of God's word? And the whole world system is really trying very desperately to keep us from believing something like that. From the get go, from the very beginning, we put all of that stuff aside and say, well, you know, science is more true than the Bible. That's, 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 what, that's what we come to accept because we're indoctrinated and we think. <laughs> we're thinking constantly that that's what really happened. The, the evolutionary theory, by the way, it's the same thing as the creation theory. It's impossible to prove. Nobody was there. Nobody can go back. You can't recreate it. So, so we, we look at God's word. If it's really true... Uh, if it really happened, then then we have to begin to accept that and realize the importance of that. Otherwise, from the beginning all the way through to Jesus Christ, resurrection from the dead. Now, how hard is that to believe? Somebody come back to life? They died for three days and they came back to life? If you don't believe that and think that, then what else is true in the Bible? Uh, what, how we think about God's word and how important we, it is to us and how we embrace that and the things that God has said to us determines many times the battles, how the battle's going to come out in the rest of your life. All of the other things that we face, you know, because if this isn't true in those two points that I've shared with you, then what, what, what else is, what else could be false in here? What else could we not, what, we just cut it out. See, I think that that's what a lot of people do in the world today. They just figured that it's not that important. And so we'll just cut out whatever we want. If it, if it affects our lifestyle, if it affects our, our families, if it affects uh, the way that we live or the way we work or the way that we earn money, all of those kinds of things. If the word of God isn't important and we haven't embraced that thought completely, we just cut that section out. Well, that was for somebody else. That was for another time. And, 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 and granted, now, there's a lot of symbolism in the Bible and there's a lot of things that only applied to the folks that it was being spoken to at that time. But Here's the thing. It was true even in that time. And so it's important for us to really capture that in our minds and to think that that what God has said is true. 
Now, here's the thing. How do you adopt that way of thinking? How do you begin to change to this new way of thinking? And and really, sometimes, you know, to, to really come to terms with this, this is a daily thing for me. The weekly thing, you know, you have to re uh, rethink through things and recommit your mind to accepting the things that God that God has for us. Um, you know, I, I was I was thinking about the the writing thing, and I'm sure that most of you have either at some point you've either attended a Western Pleasure show or you've you've been around Western Pleasure, and I know most of you all are hunters and jumpers, but. If a person decides to change from showing Western pleasure, there's a lot of changes that have to take place, right? I mean, first of all, you've got to change your saddle. That's a big deal. You're you're going to quit riding with a saddle with a horn, which most people don't even need that horn anymore anyway, unless you're out on a cattle farm. But you're going to have to change your saddle. You're, You're going to have to change your boots, you know, you've got to trade your cowboy boots in for some long black boots, kind of sleek and slender. You're going to have to change your clothes. You're not going to wear those bling shirts anymore. You're going to wear something that's more like a suit, right? And skinny pants. <laughs> You're going to trade your cowboy hat for a helmet. And, and you know what else? It's, it's not just enough to do all that. You're going to have to start thinking in English terms. You're going to have to start thinking about the way that the horse performs differently than it does in a Western pleasure show. By the way, I'm not too crazy about I, I love I love watching horses of any kind. I shouldn't even put this on. This is being recorded. But <laughs> but but let me just say uh, the way that Western uh, uh, pleasure horses perform versus the way hunters and jumpers perform. I love to watch the hunters and jumpers. I love to, I love to see the excitement in the horse, how it, how it travels around the ring. But you have to start thinking differently. And, and you know what? In those terms, we don't, we don't have a problem making that change, right? If we're going to be English riders, we're going to get rid of all that junk. Sorry, Western pleasure. If it went the other way, it would be the same deal. You know, we trade all that other stuff for the cowboy hat and, you know, whatever. And we don't really have a problem doing that. But when it comes to really thinking about spiritual things, we struggle so much to think that we have to change the whole way that we think. And yet uh, the things of the world are so contrary to the things of God. We live in the world, but we have to think We really have to think differently. And the Bible really gives us a clear plan to this. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your... Listen. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, the Christian way of thinking about things that go on in this world is different than people who have no spiritual background, no spiritual change. And so we have to have this new way of thinking uh, every single day because we're going to be challenged every day about the way that we think. Jesus' way is very, very different than the way of the world. And I probably didn't need to tell you that, but it's true. And sometimes we have to keep reminding ourselves, Jesus' way is different. Jesus thought differently about things. He shook up the whole religious world because he brought a new thought to them that instead of eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hate your enemies, Jesus all of a sudden brought this message, love your enemies. That was contrary to what they had grown up thinking. And and listen, many times the things that Jesus says to us through his word is contrary to what the world would tell you. I mean, love your enemies. That's a that's a pretty pretty difficult thing to do. Uh, Jesus Jesus uh, made a statement: "It's more blessed to give than to receive." Well, hey, how many people in this world do you see living generously and and always giving? There's a whole lot of people out there who are on the take. You know, I tell people all the time: there's two kinds of people in the world: givers and takers. You have to decide which one you are. And it seems like a lot of times there's more takers in the world than there are givers. I hope that y'all are givers. That's the best way to live because it is, it is such a blessing when you can give. But 
But the world says, get a hold of everything that you can get a hold of. When, when I'm talking about the world, I'm talking about the culture that we live in, the environment that we live in, the ideas, the philosophies that we live in. But the world says, get a hold of everything that you can get a hold of. Hold on tight. Don't share it with anybody. Don't let anybody have any of it. You're going to need it. No matter how much it is, you know, we, we, we have to come to terms with thinking like that. Uh, Jesus said, be forgiving. Who wants to forgive? I mean, when somebody hurts me, I don't think about forgiving them right off the bat. I wish I did. But that I have to come back to terms with that. And I have to sometimes I have to pray through it depends on how, how bad I've been hurt. And here's this new way of thinking about how to respond to people that, that hurt us. We've got, we've got to be forgiving. That doesn't mean we turn into doormats and we let them stomp on us. But what it, what it says is our heart is different because we're, we're thinking different about life. We've got to think about the good things that God has done in our life. Paul said, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We're responsible for our thinking. Nobody else can mess with your thinking, really. I mean, they, they can. They can get you to think things, but, but they're not going to be responsible for the things that you do because of the things that you think. We have to be responsible for those thoughts. Philippians chapter 1, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, chapter 4, uh, Paul said this, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence in any of these that are praiseworthy, let your mind... Let your thoughts dwell on these things. You see, the world's not focused on this kind of thinking. We've got to begin to think in a new way. And you know what? Changing our thinking is something that you and I aren't going to be able to do on our own. We have to have a life change. We have to have a new way to live. We talked about that last week. We've got to have a new way to live so that we have a new way to think. And if you really want to think differently about things, if you really want a new way to think, you're going to have to come to the cross. You're going to have to get your heart really right with God. Whatever whatever God wants to do in your life, you're going to have to come and you're going to have to ask him to forgive you. You're going to have to ask him to come into your life and live through you. And he's promised to do that if we just if we just call out to him and ask him to do that. But God wants to change our thinking. The Holy Spirit wants to move in our lives and cause us to think differently about this world. And believe me, when Paul said, think about all these good things, these positive things, everything right now is against thinking about the good things, isn't it? If you're on social media at all, you see all these fights you see all of these things that are being said on the, in the media, on the news and TV, and even the, even the shows that we watch are all contrary many times to what God wants to do in changing our thinking. So this morning, I would just ask you to ask God to help you change your thinking to this new way. Joseph Oppenheim made a lot of money because he had a new idea. He had new thoughts. He had a new way of thinking about manure. And I believe God calls us to think differently about life. Let me pray. Father, thank you this morning that we have this opportunity to think differently. God, sometimes the thoughts in this world and all that goes on around us just capture us and hold our attention. But today, God, we need a new way to think. We need to trust you to fill our minds and our hearts with those things that are pure and good and lovely and, and positive. And I pray, Father, that you would help us today to reach out to you and to trust you. Lord, if, if there's someone who's never had a relationship with you, that today, God, they would ask you into their life. They'd ask for the forgiveness that, that you want to give them and that you would fill their hearts, Lord, with a new way to live and a new way to think. Thank you this morning that you are true to your word, true to your promises, and that you'll do what you say. We just praise you, Father, today for this day and ask that you'll bless each rider, exhibitor. Lord, that you'll protect each one and keep them safe today. In Jesus' name, amen.